very modern nightmare, isn't it? Very chilling thought to be falsely accused of the kind of crimes that finally in this country are receiving the sort of coverage that they should have received decades ago. I imagine you've been there, especially if you're a bloke. I imagine you've sort of thought to yourself, what would happen if, if, if somebody accused me of something? Especially if it was historical, as they say. If it was something that was alleged to have happened years ago. And listen, sometimes people accused of terrible, terrible crimes are absolutely innocent, deep, deep down. They know that, but they also know that most of the world will be looking at the, uh, the smoke coming off the story and concluding that with so much smoke, there must be some fire. Not familiar with my programme, that's, that, that's absolutely fine, but just, just briefly, we, we've been covering these developing stories now for a, for a very long time. We were in at the very first floor, so to speak, of the unfolded back when everybody else was still saying things like, well, Jimmy Savile's still dead and they're all gold diggers and attention seekers. Why is, there, why is anybody investigating this? It happened 25 years ago. Uh, part of the reason for that was because uh, a paedophile who would have been operating at the school I attended between the ages of 7 and 13 was brought to justice last year by um, some of my former classmates. Uh, and, and this was 30 years after the abuse had been visited and it taught me a very, very important lesson. The clock is irrelevant to suffering. Time does not heal. If anything, in some ways, it, it gets worse as your trust issues and ramifications and, and psychological damage impacts upon your adult life as a result of things that were done to you by an adult when you were a child. So, so we got into this very, very early and we followed it very, very closely. And we were, I think, the first program to play out the um, uh, footage of the man who has accused Harvey Proctor of various crimes um, on national radio. I think, I think we, we, we did that first. The man that Harvey Proctor referred to yesterday, known only as Nick, is, um, it is his voice you've heard, his distorted voice that you've heard on this program, if you've been listening, for the last couple of years. Um, and some of the names, uh, now dead of course in the case of, of Leon Britton, but some of the names you've heard on this program as well. We hadn't mentioned Harvey Proctor, uh, except of course when he was first um, interviewed by the police, first uh, questioned by the police. We have talked a lot about Operation Midland. And we know that in March, Harvey Proctor's home in Grantham in Lincolnshire was searched. In June, uh, he was interviewed at his own request. He said the interview lasted six hours. And then yesterday, again voluntarily, interviewed for an hour and 40 minutes. And... Well, how would you phrase it, do you think? Came out fighting? I mean, came out furious. Came out, I, I, I found, slightly strange in some ways, his response. But as I said at the outset, how the hell would you respond if you found yourself accused of, I mean, in some sense, being involved in the death of children? Here's the thing. The public forum in which this is now being examined has in some ways been chosen by Mr. Proctor. Most people were not aware of his uh, identification, in the, and they certainly weren't aware of the full extent of the accusations and allegations, but they were in the public domain. So what he did yesterday in his press conference and in his interview, his excellent interview with Ian Dale, which you can see on our, on our website at lbc.co.uk, what he did yesterday was... was I think he got a loud hailer out, or a magnifying glass, and has turned much more attention upon his own situation than the media or the public had perhaps done previously. And it's too legally complicated for us to discuss the niceties of, of, of his decision, but it's not too legally complicated to discuss whether or not, whether or not this should be in the public domain at this point. You see, every single time somebody whose name is known emerges in association with accusations and allegations like this, that the, the world divides. The world divides into two groups. People who think you are innocent until proven guilty and therefore should never have your name revealed in public versus people who know that whenever these sort of stories turn out to be true, then the public identification of the culprit or the accused does bring forward other witnesses, which is, of course, what any investigating force, any investigating authority wants. So that those are the two camps. And the reason we're returning to this question today is that yesterday, as I, as I saw Mr. Proctor speaking, um, uh, speaking very fluently for, for nearly an hour and a half, you know, 
very composed, unfaltering is one of the words that's used, describing the allegations as preposterous, calling for police officers and others to, to resign, accusing them right up to the top of the Met, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, of a, of a flagrant abuse of power. Allegations of child murder, torture, abuse had, he said, wrecked his life. And my question for you this morning, very simply, is whether or not this should be happening in public or in private. Now, I believe passionately, passionately, that it should be happening in public, but even as I saw the press conference unfolding yesterday, I, I found myself returning to that conviction and wondering, really, how, 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 how hard can you cling to it? What if it was someone you knew standing there? What if it was someone you loved? What if it was someone you cared for? What if it was you? Going back decades, someone has come forward and accused you of absolutely terrible crimes, should you have the right for those accusations to remain secret until the police have completed their tasks, completed their investigations? And if the police can't find enough evidence to actually charge you, I suppose I'm just asking, is it fair? Because my heart says yes. My heart says it, it, it's the price you pay to tell bona fide victims that the authorities or the establishment will now listen to them for the first time in British history. This is the price you pay. If Harvey Proctor turns out to have been unfairly identified or unfairly accused or to be wholly, wholly innocent, as he may well do, we may never know, <sighs> that man's reputation, that man's life, which he described as having been wrecked yesterday, is the sacrifice that society makes upon the altar of victim protection. You see, even as those words come out of my mouth, I'm wondering whether I can back them up with my brain as opposed to my heart. The, the price you pay for telling all victims that they will be treated with fairness and respect is the possibility that some people may see their reputations unfairly besmirched and their lives unfairly dismantled. Discuss. Right, let's get the phone lines open. Help me out on this one. That's it, I think, isn't it? That's the nub of the question. We do not know, we cannot speculate, we will not discuss the nature or, or the accuracy of these accusations. But what you do know is a man whose name is known to you and to me yesterday went ballistic, so to speak, and very publicly to discuss the uh, claims by one man that he had been witness to some truly, truly heinous acts, murder, torture, uh, rape, or, or, or all of the um, horrors that you'd imagine to be associated with a story like this. And if Harvey Proctor didn't do any of these things, is what is happening to him now a price we should be prepared to pay as a society in order to tell genuine victims, bona fide victims, of child sex abuse that they will not be treated with contempt, derision and disgust because they still are in this country. Just less than ever before. What do you reckon? Let's get the phone lines open. 0345 606973 is the number to call. Um, you can email me, james at lbc.co.uk. You can text me on 84850. That, that's the only question. Uh, it, 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 if he is completely and wholly innocent, as, as he told Ian Dale last night that he is, and as he announced in this 90-minute press conference yesterday, then is the damage done to a reputation or a name such as his a price worth paying for creating a, an environment in which people can come forward decades after being abused in the knowledge that they'll actually be listened to? I, I don't know. This is what Harvey Proctor said to Ian Dale last night about the police's handling of the investigation. Do you think any young people were abused by politicians at Dolphin Square? Do you think there was a Westminster Peter Fathering? I am sure that there has been historic child sexual abuse, and I made it clear in my statement that I have the utmost sympathy and support for genuine victims. I think the word isn't right. I think it should be complainants. I, I think that that's certainly true. Uh, it may well be that the odd MP here and there may well have done something, but not in concert, in a gang, 
in so, parties, so, so the, as has been alleged by the police, because members of Parliament at the time, remember hom the climate was completely different, uh, you could hardly be a homosexual and a member of Parliament at that time for any party. I think there may have been one Labour member of Parliament who was out at the time. So people, members of Parliament, kept to themselves. They didn't but, but, discuss. But this they didn't discuss. This isn't about gay members of Parliament, they, is they it? This is about paedophiles. And, the, and they, the, but they, uh, you will agree with me that just because you're gay, that doesn't mean to say you're a paedophile. No, absolutely not. But the allegations have been of a homosexual nature, not a heterosexual paedophile nature. What I'm saying is, at the time, members of Parliament did not routinely comment one to the other about their sex life or what they were or were so not doing So you don't believe that bedroom. there was a sort of organized paedophile ring. You think there may have been the odd incident, but, but not an organized paedophile ring, because if, that's the allegation here. If there was, I did not know about it at the time, and I certainly was not involved in any of it. It's quarter past ten. How else does Mr Proctor expect the police to gather evidence after 30, 40 years, if not by going public, asks the first tweet into the programme this morning. This period is necessary. Um, but should be a one-off. It's not a price that we pay, as a society says Oz, it's a price that the accused pay. That's true. But society judges whether or not the law supports the sacrifice. So, if we want to create a country in which people can come forward with accusations of abuse and know that they will be treated with respect and decorum, do we have to run the risk of unfairly and inaccurately ruining the reputations of some men. And that is where Harvey Proctor has cast himself today. We don't know whether or not he's being unfairly traduced or not, but we know that he says that he is. Is that a price that the society you live in should pay? Uh, do you know I'm not sure? James O'Brien on LBC. It's a strange um, topic of discussion this morning because it, the principle of people being publicly accused of heinous crimes is one that I'm very comfortable with. Uh, I think it's important that these accusations are levelled publicly because that is the only way they can be properly examined. But when you actually see it happening in practice, when you see one individual person, an old man in this case, albeit an old man with a, with a checkered and, uh, and criminal past, it just seems a very high price to pay. A very, very high price to pay, which is why I just want to know what you think. And if you are a survivor of child abuse, what do stories like this do for you? How do stories like this... How do stories like this help you decide whether or not the society you live in has become more sympathetic or indeed less sympathetic than it used to be. If you hit the numbers now, you will get through. This will not be an hour, I have to tell you, when my phones ring off the hook. Uh, we, we made a pledge a couple of years ago to continue having these conversations, however uncomfortable and difficult they become, and, and you've allowed me to keep that pledge. But, but I can tell you, it's not like asking whether or not you've got a problem with uh, immigration or have had a parking ticket you don't like. My phones do not ring off the hook on this, so if you've got something interesting to say, say it. It's, it's just... The difference between imagining somebody like a, a nameless, faceless paedophile, is it fair for this nameless, faceless paedophile to be named in public? And everyone shouts, yes. And then just imagine it's you and you are innocent. Would you, would you still, can you still shout yes? Tony's in Woodford. Tony, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, James, this, you know, these, these allegations that have been made, they're absolutely terrible. Yes. And the fact that you know, he's gone on air. I mean, he's not going to admit anything, is he? He's going to deny it because th those those type of offenders that do these things, they've got such an arrogance about them. They never seem to want to admit anything. Well, no, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I mate, I, I don't think it's arrogance. If I accused you of raping children, you'd deny it pretty flipping passionately, wouldn't you? It wouldn't make you arrogant. No, no. What I mean is, James, when they've, when they've gone on to be found guilty of, of, you know, I'm thinking of some of the celebrities and stuff. Uh, like of that. course, we've seen impassioned speeches yeah. from the court yeah. steps and the, and supported by the loving family. Whether it was, uh, you hesitate to remember who's been found guilty and who hasn't. Uh, but but legally speaking, we, we we've seen it with Stuart Hall. We've seen it with other um, public figures as well. But. <laughs> Can you see the problem I've got today, Tony? It's it's not a particularly sophisticated or complicated problem, but it's 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 the principle versus the practice. So the principle is 
Should we be naming these people so that we can properly examine the allegations and see if any other witnesses or accusers come forward? And we all show, yeah, of course we should. But then you actually see somebody, in this case a 68-year-old man, with, with a, an air of, uh, you might say arrogance, others might say vulnerability, and he is being publicly examined without being charged over crimes that practically beg a belief. So the principle I can nod along with, but when you see it happening in practice, does it not give you any pause at all? Innocent and so proven guilty, absolutely everything you said is, is spot on. But then why volunteer for, for an interview? And why do a 90-minute press conference? Because I suppose, you know, you know people are discussing it, you know that it is in the public domain, if not achieving anything like the profile that it has previously achieved. It's a very pertinent question, though, mate. I've got to be honest with you. It, it, it's just a tough one to answer within the bounds of of the law. Uh, why would you give a 90-minute press conference and draw loads more attention to these allegations and accusations than they were previously receiving? I don't know. Only he could tell us that. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need to tell me what you think about this curious tension between a, a, a presumption of innocence but a need for publicity. Martin's in St. Albans. Martin. Morning, James. I agree with you. I agree with you many on, on many things, but on this occasion, I have to take issue with you. Okay. Uh, what, what you're advocating by naming uh, suspects or publicising the details is you're advocating trial by media rather than trial by jury. No, I'm not. Um, well, we have a fundamental issue that everybody says. No, because e every 30 yeah, seconds this morning, I, just just to clarify, I will, I, I'll let you talk lots, but I just, I mean, you're wrong when you say that I'm advocating trial by media, and I want you to understand why. Every 30 seconds, I've said this man could be wholly innocent. The entire purpose of this conversation is built upon the presumption that he might be. So, I'm not advocating trial by media. But if, you, if somebody made these allegations against you, yes. Um, which came out of the blue, yes. and you had no prior knowledge, and obviously you, you know, they, were, they were completely fabricated for whatever reason. What would your immediate reaction be? One of shock, horror, and outrage, and you would do everything um, to protect your family and to protect those around yes, but, you. But right? that would also be my reaction if I was guilty. But, but, but why should this be in the public domain, whereas in any other area of the law, um, you're innocent until proven guilty? And this, you know, yeah, but you're publicly are, named in every other area of the law, Martin. But you're not if you're, you're, you are protected until you're, you're not charged, protected. You are, you're protected until you're charged. I can, I, if the police, if the police okay, question the police you today... Well, well, Martin, let's not have an argument. Let's just confine ourselves to facts. The police arrest, but if the police question you today, I can mention it on the radio tomorrow. Um, but the, the whole... Why should Harvey be treated differently from anybody else? Just because he's an ex-MP. But why should uh, oxygen be given to this publicity when, when it is simple, when these are allegations? You know, if there is not, if, if, if somebody. How, how do you examine allegations in secret without asking if anybody else can corroborate them? Well, why do you have to mention people's names? You can get to. Well, how, how, okay, how do you f let's use a false name then? Let's just call it. Uh, let's let's say it's um, uh, uh, John Doe. Person A. Let's say it's person A has person A stands accused of certain crimes. How can you ask the British public whether they think per whether they have any knowledge of person A committing certain crimes without naming person A, Martin? Because uh, if you can answer that question, I'll give you the point. But what's the point in answering, in asking the great, great British public? Because you know when you ask great. Because great that's where the other potential victims no, might be. No, but hold on, you'll get 5,000 people, 300 of which will confess to anything, 300 of which will make it up, nah. 300 of it... You, no, you at least you're honest. Care. No, at least you're honest. So, so, because there might be some false accusations, we forget about the true ones. Of course they will. Of course they so will. we ignore the true ones. Don't forget about Stuff the true them. ones. Sod them. You actually ask the police to do a proper job, which is How? they used to be, which is to investigate these things. Martin, I, I, so I don't... Based on, the, based on the information that this so-called... Uh, whistleblower brings forward not okay i'm just going to ask you one i'm going to ask you one more time how can i find out what person a has done if i'm not allowed to ask people anything about person a you're allowed to ask anyone you like anything you like but you don't have to publicize it if somebody makes a, an allegation no, martin i don't think you're listening you. mate listen hang on here is a large crowd of people okay you don't know who's in that crowd, but you want to know whether or not anybody in that crowd can support accusations and allegations being made about Person A. I want you now to address that crowd in a way that asks them about Person A without mentioning Person A, because if you can do that, then you've got a point. If you can't, you haven't. 
I'm going to turn the binoculars around, though. Oh, so flipping out, mate. No, you're not. What? It's 27 minutes after 10. And that, I'm afraid, with respect to Martin, is the sound of someone who doesn't think the survivors or the victims are important enough to run the risk of some false accusations going public. Gave him a chance. Here is a crowd of people. In that crowd of people, you, as an investigating officer, want to establish whether or not anybody else has any stories to tell, allegations to level about person A. But, and Martin is not alone, there are newspaper columnists who are similarly myopic and cruel. You cannot do that unless you name person A. How can I ask you what, what Bertie Blenkinsop has been up to? Have you got any stories about Bertie Blenkinsop if I'm not allowed to mention Bertie Blenkinsop? Paul's in uh, Camberley. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, Blenkinsop has been up to. Have you got any stories about... No, I'll turn your radio off, mate. Paul, what, what, what would you like to say? Uh, I have two points. Yeah. Um, point one says, I do think that the use of the word victim is emotive because that automatically assumes a crime was committed. I think, you know, claimant is, is, is far more neutral. But perhaps more importantly than that, um, I think it's right that you publicly name people in these scenarios simply for the point you raised earlier. You have to get enough evidence to uh, decide whether a crime has been committed or not. That said, if... That there was no crime, you've then caused reputation or financial damage to the person who has been uh, you know, falsely accused. And I think in the same way that society has a right to, let's say, name that person to get evidence, then society needs to, to financially compensate that person for either reputational damage and or you know, commercial damage. But that, that would, wouldn't that apply in every single court case that didn't deliver a guilty verdict? Well, no, 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 because there's a difference between being charged and found innocent versus being accused without being charged. But then you're not found innocent. Correct. Because if, you, if, you're, if, you're, not found, if you're not charged, it's, your, it's death by innuendo. And that's what you should get compensation for. Correct, because... The, even though, I, I understand your point, but, uh, I mean, in, in a lot of these cases that are still dubbed historical, you may well have uh, incidents of, of crimes being unable to be proven, but, but by no means enough to conclude that the accused is therefore innocent. And you're going back 30, 40 years. These are very, very difficult points yeah, to prove. But, but society, but it's, it's a two-way street. So if society wants to, let's say, publicly identify someone in order to gain uh, the opportunity to get evidence... That society's right. I think yeah. that's a fair thing to do. But at the same time, if, if, that, if that process does not garner enough evidence for the CPS to, to believe on the balance of probability there is a case to be answered... No, I disagree. I, I, it's a good point, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a nice sort of balance, if you will, but I, I don't want the CPS to be ha handcuffed or hamstrung by fears of, of having to pay out... Well, hang on, we better lay off that one, because we'd have to pay him a fortune if we looked into that and got it wrong. I want them to look into it without fear or favour. And that is precisely the point, Paul, that you brilliantly highlight. Is this something that we are comfortable with? Because you can't just say, yeah, I'm comfortable with Harvey Proctor getting turned over like this in public. You have to say, and this is the point, isn't it? You have to say, yeah, I, I, I'd have to live with that. To support the point I'm making, I would have to endorse the notion of someone accusing me of something as horrible as this, being able to do it in public. James O'Brien on LBC. 25 minutes to 11. Harvey Proctor's name was previously synonymous with a sleazy sex scandal involving rent boys, spankings and him paying young men to call him Sir, and also to call him Keith, for reasons that I've never been able to satisfactorily establish, while pretending that he was their headmaster. Um, it's associated with an altogether different sort of story now, after he gave a 90-minute press conference yesterday, lambasting the police for questioning him about allegations made by a man now in his late 40s um, that he and other young boys were the victims of systematic and serious sexual abuse by a group of men between 1975 and 1984. So... Harvey Proctor decided to shine a lot more light onto his own situation than either the media or the authorities had previously done. Um, and he did so while protesting furiously his innocence. Uh, at which point I think it's only fair to say two things. Number one, he may well be innocent. And number two, everybody who isn't innocent furiously protests their innocence in cases such as these right up until the final minute. But he hasn't been charged, which seems to be pertinent. But he hasn't been charged the police would presumably say, because they don't yet have all their ducks in a row. 
They need more ducks or more evidence before deciding whether or not to proceed with an investigation. And what that means, of course, is that they need to ask the British public. Any other potential witnesses or, or accusers need to be asked. And the problem I've got, I wouldn't go so far as to say I felt sympathy for Harvey Proctor yesterday, but I would go so far as to say that I felt empathy. I just imagined what it would feel like to be him. Imagine if it was a bolt from the blue. Knock on the door. I, we've all wondered about it. We've all feared it. What if someone made a, a, a terrible, terrible accusation about you? just to do you harm, just to do you damage. There's an awful story around last week about a, a, a website owner having a SWAT team sent to her house by a, a false report called in by a, by a computer hacker. And, and just because the accusation or the claim or the report is false doesn't in any way mitigate the damage it does to you. So I can look at Harvey Proctor and say very calmly, unfortunately for him, this has to happen. But then you imagine it's you or your dad or your brother or someone you know, your husband. And can, I don't know, can you still cling to that? How do you still cling to that? And how do the police find out if there's any more evidence out there without revealing who the evidence they're looking for is about? That seems to be a big problem in this case. 10.37, James is in Reading. James, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. Oh. Um, just in, to address that particular point about yes. how the police could perhaps... Um, garner some evidence without naming names, could they just not make something like a public appeal to say that they're investigating incidents that occurred in certain periods, 70s and 80s, in London, in parts, wherever, and uh, ask for witnesses to come forward, and then they cull that information and make the links and all the join all the dots from that information once they've verified whether the witnesses, or not, not the witnesses, but the people giving evidence are... Um, I mean, it, it, it doesn't work like that. All, all, all of the sort of authorities tell me, and, and all of actually as well survivors tell me, that they, they kind of need more than a, than a blanket invitation to come forward because well, there are two reasons for that. Number one, what you're suggesting would be far too big a net to cast, especially for a police service that can no longer spare the resources to investigate burglaries. You'd, you'd effectively have to investigate every single person coming forward with a tale of... Um, abuse from the past. Essentially, that's what we're going to have to do now, though. No, it isn't, because you narrow it down by, by naming names, by saying we're looking for, for people who may have stories to tell us about X, Y, and Z. And it, it's just in pragmatic terms. It, it, it's a so focusing... You, you, you narrow it down anyway by, by virtue of the people's age, by, um, you know, whether they were around... Yeah, but that's that such time. a huge net... It just, well, I think I, it, I mean you might in an ideal I, world you might be right but it, I think in pure practicalities that net's too big to, to anyone for anyone to sift through I want to find out whether or not James in Reading has ever tail-ended someone before in his car because he just tail-ended me this morning how am I going to do that without mentioning James in Reading because your theory is well anyone who's ever been hit up the boot by a car behind them needs to come forward to the authorities and then we'll go through it all with a fine tooth comb narrow it down to people called James and narrow it down to people from Reading and then hopefully finally find out whether or not anyone called James from Reading has actually been responsible for do you see what I mean it's huge it's yeah, huge I, mean, but I don't think tail ending is, is quite as common as, as what what the allegations are that um, the police are trying to sort of uh, investigate at the moment well, I, I, on one yeah, level of course thankfully you're right but but on another level I, I, I just have to take my word for it the the, the, the issues are huge I, everyone knows someone everyone knows someone and I guess I guess it is fair to say that if you're famous or a household name then it's worth naming you in public because anybody from Land's End to John O'Groats might have a, an association. But if it's, if it's, you know, Burt Perkins from number 14 Acacia Avenue, then it's going to be a very small... So that's why they go in the local paper rather than the national paper. If you're a former MP, it's national news. If you're a former scoutmaster, it's local news. But in both cases, names get out there and other witnesses potentially come forward. I do feel sorry for him, though. I, I, I oddly... Uh, well, not oddly. I feel sorry for any man having to endure this in public before the truth has fully emerged. Any man, before the truth has fully emerged. George is in Brixton. George, what would you like to say? Uh, hello, mate, yeah. All right, George. Um, my, my experience, um, when I was a kid, I mean, I'm in my 60s now, you know. Yeah. When I was a, when I was a kid, um, a priest used to take us camping, and that's where the abuse happened to me. 
my mother was a very religious person, so was my sister. When I called him a paedophile, my sister said, well, he never did anything to me. My mum wouldn't have believed me. I've had counselling over the years and I've never got over it. But how do I contact these kids and say, look, were you a victim? But if some, if it came on the news, this guy was being investigated, boy, believe me, I'd be phoning up the police and saying, look, it happened to me. With the belief that finally somebody believed me, this guy's going to be, you know, brought to, well, he can't be brought to justice, he's dead. But I still feel that nobody believed me. And, you know, I felt it was my fault, yeah. in a sense, you know. And if, it, if somebody actually said, look, this guy's name, then I would say, hey, look, it happened to someone else. And I know it must have happened to I, kids, but, I, 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 I couldn't have timed your call better, could I, following on from, from, from the last fella, because th there's, a, there's a natural, compassionate impulse to, to protect people who may be falsely accused. But, but what you remind us is that without the name there, without the name, you wouldn't be able to find the courage or the confidence to come forward. Yeah. I know it probably sounds terrible. But... No, it doesn't. Your phone line sounds terrible, George, but given, given the context of the conversation, I think we'll let that pass for once. It, it doesn't sound terrible, my friend. I promise you it doesn't sound terrible. Yeah, I want somebody else to have been a victim so that I know I'm not the only one. It sounds terrible to say I want someone else to be not, the no, one. No, no, oh, okay. I understand what you mean. And then we can all say, look, you know, he was doing this for 20 years. You were a victim, I was a victim. Now... And then I can, I can rest in my grave saying, at least, you know, it, it, it's out now, you know? I do know. I, I actually do know because I've spoken to men like you in the past and women who, who, who've been through similar suffering in the past. And, and thanks to what you tell me, I do know. I didn't used to know. I didn't used to understand. I used to say things like, well, look, if it was 30 odd years ago, for goodness sake, why haven't you come forward sooner? I now know why you why you haven't come forward sooner. And part of the reason, as, as you've just explained to us, is that you've been disbelieved by your own mum, potentially, or your own sister. What, what faith are you going to have in a stranger in a uniform? Especially when it was a stranger in a form of uniform that abused you in the first place. But And he, he baptised me when I was a baby. Oh, but can mate. I just say... Of course you can. ...that I didn't cry. The first time I cried, I was 25 years old, and I cried for two hours solid. Not for me, but for that little boy back then who said, yeah, I like this. You know, are you enjoying this? Yeah, I am. Why didn't I turn around and say... No, I'm not enjoying it. I'm going to tell my mum. Because you were do that? Because you were a little boy. I was boy. 25 years old and I cried for two hours solid. My wife was in panic because she thought I was having a breakdown or something. And then she was the first person I told. What, but what? after that, I wasn't ashamed of telling people. But even when I went to counselling, I, I spoke to this counsellor and he said to this other counsellor that was in the room, did you see how quickly he got to the point? Almost as if he was proud of what happened to him. And I just got up and walked out. And I thought, you know, I've just got to carry this burden for the rest of my life. Are you getting more help it's now? Terrible. You, do you get better help no. now? No. I'm still sitting quiet for that little boy. I'm, I'm in my 60s, you know? And I'm choked now thinking about it. Yeah, of course you are. You know, it, 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 it happened. And I want... If, if the guy was ever mentioned, somebody mentioned his name, believe me, I'd be phoning the police and saying, me too, mate. Thank God for that. It's it's psychological, isn't it? That that there's a difference yeah. between joining and leading, mm. and to expect you to find what it, you'd need to find within you to lead, to put your hand up, stick your head above the parapet alone, the difference is epic between doing that and joining someone else in the process. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, my sister used to go camp as well, and when when I said to her, uh, she mentioned his name at my dad's funeral, and I said. Don't talk to me about that paedophile. She immediately jumped to me saying, he's not a paedophile, how dare you call him that? And I said, well, it happened. She said, well, he never did anything to me. So I thought, well, that's just the reaction I'm getting. So what is the point? Just drag it through life again. You don't get over it, James, you don't. I know. I, know. I mean, I'm, I'm in my 60s. Why am I getting upset about a guy that did something to me 50 years ago, you know? What would you say? What would you say to people? And and there's one newspaper columnist in particular who keeps writing, and Jimmy Savile is still dead. People who say that because your abuser is dead, you should just park your desire for justice or truth or or or, or, or to what, just get over it. He's dead. Well, you you don't want to be running around waving a flag saying, "Look, I was the victim of." You, you don't want to be doing that. You just want people to believe you, and 
I don't know. I don't know really what it is I want, but it's I'm the only one that's carrying this, you know, and I want it out there. And, and the fact that the guy said, you know, I mean, his children went on to, to break things. I even phoned his son one day because I thought I found um, a book yeah. that had details of him, and I thought, you know what, found that his son, and I phoned his son and his son. I thought, I want you to know what your father was like. And then when his wife answered the phone and said, he's not here at the moment, but if you phone back later, and I thought, do I want to destroy this family? What have they done to me? Nothing. It was their dad. And so there again, you know, I had to just put a lid on it and keep it to myself. You're a bloody good bloke, George. Oh, I don't think so. I do. Thank you, James. My there you go. James O'Brien on LBC. Before that, we're talking about, well, all sorts, really, specifically Harvey Proctor and his bizarre conference yesterday. Quite a lot of you are pointing out something that passed me by at the time, which is that um, it must be nice being famous or being a household name and knowing that the world's media will, the country's media will turn up for a 90-minute press conference if you find yourself questioned by the police. It's not a privilege that many of us would necessarily enjoy. And then George's call, which in a way drives a coach and horses through any reservations about doing these things publicly, when he said, how do I find out whether or not any other children were abused by the priest who abused me if I can't name him? So if you're troubled by or sympathetic to Harvey Proctor's position, which is an understandable place to be, answer George's question. How does Nick find out whether or not anybody else can come forward Nick is the man, of course, who has levelled these accusations and allegations at, at Harvey Proctor and others. That's according to Harvey Proctor's account yesterday. Uh, and I mention Nick because I know he's, he's listening to the programme at the moment. I know he will um, uh, be, be keen to know how much support and sympathy you've expressed for him over the years. But this, this story now is moving on to a whole new level. And, and as you would expect, it brings with it some whole new problems. One of which is, what if it was you? What, I mean, you have to accept, regardless of, of one man's guilt or innocence, that this is a process that will sometimes see innocent men and women publicly lambasted for crimes that are beyond the ken of most of us. And that's the price we have to be prepared to pay if we're ever going to make people like George feel that they can come forward. That's my view, all right, and it could be wrong. I happen to passionately subscribe to it, but I don't want this to be one of those days where anyone who disagrees with me is in, 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 stuck in the corner. Danny's in Archway. Danny, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, I saw the Harvey Proctor interview or listened to it, and uh, like you say, no-one else is going to get that platform. No-one else, an ordinary person, has wrongly accused of anything, is not going to get that platform. Uh, my grievance with the establishment and so on, I went through the family courts and I had my reputation dragged through the courts as, as in a custody battle for my children. Yes. I didn't get a chance to stand up and argue back. I basically got uh, crucified by the family courts. And as far as I'm concerned, the establishment family courts are run by the establishment for the establishment, always have... You've done a bit off message, mate. Just, just, just steer it back towards being... Yeah, you know, what I'm saying, with Harvey Proctor, ordinary people don't get that chance. So No, but all, ordinary people don't make the national news when they're questioned either so what happened to you in the family court wasn't on the front of the daily mail the next day was it no what i'm saying is it still leaves you with a grievance it leaves you feeling i've been treated unfairly and i've got no voice to to speak there are thousands of fathers that have gone through no that. there are but there are also thousands of fathers who have abused their children and being violent and if we're gonna yeah. if we're gonna somehow seek to silence their accusers to help people like you then surely we're, we're, we're throwing well, no, I feel he shouldn't have a, an, an anonymity. I don't feel he should be allowed that privilege. I think that what's been going on in the last few years, there has been establishment cover-ups. The powers that be are still backing these people and trying to shuffle the cards and make it look like it. But I, I feel that Harvey Proctor's name, it, it keeps coming up in the same circle of people. It well, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I've got to be honest with you. I'm, I'm aware now of the questions he's been asked because he has told us, but, but um, I, I, I don't perhaps spend as much time poring over some of the internet coverage as, as others do. I enjoy the Exero News website's um, coverage of the story, but I, I'm always a little bit wary, not just because of libel laws and what I happen to do for a living, but, but of, of presuming fire wherever there's smoke, because sometimes, as you know yourself from your experience in the family court, there can be smoke but no fire. Exactly, but I feel in these situations, with this sort of cover-up, 
uh, basically he should have gone the other way and said, I'm helping the police with my inquiries. These are heinous crimes, and if there's any way I can help the police with their inquiries, I would do so. Instead, he'd attack the police. He didn't attack Labour politicians. This is not about party politics. This goes across the board. In, but what would you do, though? What, what would you, I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? In, in, it's a weird exercise in conversation this morning, but as, as I've said before, we're going to have these conversations for as long as we have to. It's a weird... Because almost every point you make is brilliantly powerful and irresistible and irrefutable against the backdrop of you talking about a guilty person. But equally, all of the points you make tend to fall apart a little bit if we are talking about an innocent person. I'm <laughs> Oh, Tony's in Doncaster. Tony, what would you like to say? Well, before we decide about whether the the, the case should be, uh, you know, virtually decided in the public domain or kept in the private domain, yeah, we need to answer a question individually. Go on. And the individual question is: Do you want it to be true? Do you want this person to be guilty? Do you want a, a paedophile ring to have existed in the upper echelons of Westminster? Why, 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 I don't understand why you have to ask that question. Surely you just have to ask, do you want the truth? The reason you have to ask that question is because the further you push it into the public domain, the more impartiality about your ultimate judgment goes out the window. Why? I just want the truth. Y you want the truth based on your own personal prejudices, you mean? No, I just want the truth. Well, that you see, James, that you've got a problem there because <laughs> what you want to do is live. You can't the handle the world. truth. Now, <laughs> you want to live in the perfect world, but unfortunately, we don't live in the perfect. No, world. No, I just, I don't, I don't want to live in a perfect world. I just want the truth about this particular story. Well, if you're, if you're, and how am I going to get the truth if if it's under lock and key? Well, it's not, un it's not under lock and key. It would be if it wasn't in public. Well, the, pe the people that we pay to get to the bottom of issues like this... ...have decided uh, that they want to go public with it. And they've decided they want to go public with it. Well, what you've got to decide before you take it any further is, what do you want the outcome to be? The truth. I don't, I mean, this isn't a trick question or a trick answer. I don't understand the point you think you're making, Tony. The point I'm making is that I would say the vast majority of people want the paedophile ring to have existed, and they also want this person that we're talking about to be guilty. And that, that bias, that constitutes a bias, a prejudice? That constitutes a prejudice that we're all subject to, and... I think most people would rather it wasn't true, but, but are maybe moving towards a place where they believe reluctantly that it might be. I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, the notion of desire, I want it to be true that lots of children were abused horribly in this way, is, is, is quite an odd... Starting point. I understand your point better now, but but I, I I still think it's bogus. I think by the time the media have finished with it, you will be led to a point where you will. Hey, the be media, began. the media wouldn't get out of bed to cover this story until about a month ago. The media yeah. have been part of the part of the lock and key process, not part of the shining a light process. You couldn't get arrested with these sort of issues until about six months ago. Until Nick had the interview with the police, really. Me yeah, media haven't been near it. I, mean, I, 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 I think I understand the point that you're making, but I don't think that it is really a, a, an answer to the question that we were asking. George's Call writes, um, Tom Perry, who runs the Mandate Now charity, George's Call indicated that he was abused by a priest. Did others know this is the very reason why mandatory reporting is essential? Um, a lot of themes that we've covered over the months being tied together there, and we will return to these themes again in the future.